the leads that they came out with earlier in the year about speckled trout. And uh, I know that prompted a lot of questions, uh, some of which Jason might not be able to answer because he told me that you know, all of their data is not collected yet, but he certainly will be able to touch on you know, some of the speckled trout, some of what they're seeing, and then certainly uh, if you have any questions about L.A. Creel right now, uh, he would be the guy to talk to. So Jason, take it away. Thank you for coming. Thanks, Chuck. Uh, yeah, like Joe said, I'm Jason Adrian. I'm in the breeding fisheries section. Uh, I actually uh, head up the saltwater fin fish program. So all, all your trout, redfish, anything with a fin that swims, that's uh, my responsibility. And, and like Joe said, our stock assessment isn't quite finalized yet. So uh, I won't answer any questions in relation to the stock assessment. But what we have here is uh, some of the information in here is stuff that is important to that stock assessment, but it's not everything. <clears throat> so, but but I'll start off with going from MRIP to Lacreel. I think it's important to set the stage and it kind of gives you an idea of where we are now and how we're doing things, how we're accounting for landings estimate. So we, we had MRIP and uh, you know, this was a lengthy dockside survey. It was over 30 plus questions. It was legal sized, double sided, and it was it it was really painful for the anglers and the biologists collecting that information. Um, and it was also it, it's an antiquated effort survey. It it dealt in a recall period of weeks to months. Uh, they contacted everybody in a coastal area, not just licensed anglers. So. It, uh, it was called their Coastal Household Telephone Survey. I think it basically, if you live in a, uh, they define them as coastal counties, but so if you were in a coastal parish, you were eligible. Um, and it was landline based, which wasn't an issue necessarily when the survey started, but it, it became an issue these days. Um, mm -hmm. Since everybody's got a, a cell phone. It was very inflexible. We, it, we were contracted by NOAA, we would, conduct the surveys in the state of Louisiana. However, if there were issues that we saw, that was a giant general survey that was nationwide. So there was no flexibility to change anything. If, if we wanted to ask a particular different question that was more specific to Louisiana, or if we just saw an issue with how the survey was conducted, we couldn't do that. Um, and, and I kind of covered this. It, it, it was a one size fits all is how they tried to squeeze this thing in, it was designed to be, uh, like I said, a single survey based on some geog geography and industry in a couple of states, and then they went and applied it nationwide, and it, it just doesn't work, and it gave us only statewide estimates. Um, we were getting to a point where we wanted information that was not just statewide, and slow turnaround. MRIP moved in two-month two waves, so after two months of data collect was collected, then it would go through their QA, QC program. They, they'd run things and it spit out estimates. And for January, February, let's say, you might get those estimates in April or May if you're lucky. Uh, but, so, whoops, hey. Uh, we needed something else. What did we need? We wanted a short dockside survey to, to minimize that burden on anglers. Um, we wanted to focus. We wanted a focused effort survey. So we wanted shorter recall times. We wanted it tied to the license holders. And one thing that had become more increasingly important is getting a handle on who and how many fish offshore. Um, so that was one thing we needed. We wanted flexibility. We wanted to be able to tack if we needed to. If we saw an issue uh, where we needed to ask one particular, add a question to the survey for a year or two, or uh, change the methodology slightly, we wanted to be able to do that and not have to petition that. And if then NOAA would even change it, they would go through a lengthy review process. Um, so specific to our local needs, basically, is, is what that gets at. And we wanted basin level estimates. Um, we have unique basins in this state, and a statewide estimate um, is not going to give us the best characterization of, of what we're seeing in different areas of the state. And we also wanted a quick turnaround. So currently, Lacreel, 
Our estimates are done on a weekly basis. Now it takes us about nine days to get the estimates for a week before, but compare that to four months. Um, I think we're moving slightly faster. Um, and we wanted landing <laughs> estimates that everybody could trust and uh, MRIP had some trust issues. All right, so why? Oh, this thing quit All right. We wanted to make sure our anglers had equal access to offshore sport fish under federal management. So, it, you know, red snapper played a big, big part in, in starting this train rolling. Uh, we have a multi-million dollar recreational industry that needed support. We wanted to increase that angler participation and management. And uh, there were also some side benefits we could look on uh, with Lacreel. We could tailor things. So if we want to look at things like how, what is use of, of artificial reefs and what are the catch rates and estimates off of just artificial reefs, let's say, as opposed to uh, other, other locations. Um, and the one thing weekly Weekly landings gives us a good handle on. You can see these small scale natural events as they happen. When we had the flooding up around Baton Rouge and, and that part of the state, you saw the impact of landings. They showed up almost immediately in our landings data in the effort. Let's see if I can advance this without jumping too slow. All right. Uh, nope. <laughs> Jason, real quick, is yeah. that because fewer people were fishing uh, because of the impact? Or yeah, so you had everybody was working on cutting houses, fixing their houses, or uh, <clears throat> let's say you worked in construction, you were busy, you had so many more jobs now, and, and the effort was just reduced, and you could see it. Oh, and, and that brings up some great, if you feel like stopping me in the middle of this instead of waiting to the end, if you got a specific question, just jump in and stop me. I'd one, one thing I'd like to ask you, talking about L.A. Creel, I asked Chris and him this kind of question last year. When I go down and around these all, I used to see them there all the time mm -hmm. at different uh, marinas. And I got, I've been seven, eight times this year. Okay. I have not yet. And Are we where, going off of old data where that L.A. Creel does, or do they still do it? I, I don't where, know. Where, where are you fishing? Fushan, or Fushan. Venice, Grand Island. Okay. We're, I'll tell you, those areas, we're there constantly. I don't know if it's just timing. We have, yeah, so there's a set number of weekday and then weekend assignments. Uh, and they're drawn randomly. So, it, and it's, it's, it's split between weekday. There's, um, you're gonna have per coastal study area, so per basin, we're gonna divide those out. We're gonna have X amount of weekday assignments and X amount of weekend assignments. Now there's more weekend assignments. Right. And then when we draw those particular marinas, we base it on what we call pressure. So our biologists go out and, and throughout the year, they're looking at activity at a particular launch and they're gauging that activity in relation to that time of year. And that goes into the proportions and then that goes into you know, the big black box computer and it fits out a probability of someone being at that location. So I guess I just missed, but I, I do get the survey. Yeah, and, and, and then some the other some thing of is, comes off of too also. yeah, so the other thing is we'll draw them in that sense weekday, weekend, but then there's also AM, PM. Uh, so if you're coming back in the afternoon and that site had an AM assignment, you're not going to see them or vice versa. Yeah. Uh, so we implemented the yeah. December 31st, 2013. We ended our participation in MRIP. And January 1st, we rolled out Lacreel. Let me do this. All right. Oh, oh it's still doing it. Oh. Okay. Stop. It's got a hair trigger. It does. <laughs> Man. Okay. So uh, these are our Lacreel basins. And all these white dots, those are the marinas and launches we go to. <coughs> So, and that, that delta, those delta <coughs> estimates, while it's, it's treated separately for, for drawing assignments and such, that effort ends up being part of the Barataria Basin estimates, just for reference. So all those little, uh, no, I can't hardly speak from there. Yeah, all these little, little white, that, that's, uh, uh, but that's not where, like, where snap and stuff come in. That, the creel taken up uh, like speckled trout. No, right? most of your red snapper, obviously. Right, you're going to down here, here, over here. 
Black and like brown, like punch train. Yeah, uh, what, what was the question about? Like okay. those, those, those samples they take and they have rest not put stuff up there? No, no, no. no. This is, so that, so <coughs> LA Creel is not red snapper specific. It's all oh, species, right. all saltwater species. Correct, so uh, red snapper drove a large part of the train in, in mm -hmm. getting to this point, but we replaced, like if you see a lot of the other Gulf states have these, separate red snapper surveys, or Florida has their Gulf Reef fish survey. Um, those are not specific to all their marine fish landings. Are we implemented a survey that's, that's all species? Uh, we didn't just stop with red snapper. So who's doing all these surveys? I mean, you guys. Our biologists. Uh, and I don't have the exact number on me, so don't quote me, but I wanna say we we contact in the 10 to 12,000 people a year in those dock side surveys. We're touching 80, 90,000 fish. All right. uh, so we went through all this, and, and from the minute we started, we actually let NOAA know, hey, we're, we're doing this. <coughs> We actually, in 2015, we had meetings with NOAA Fisheries, their statisticians, and some consultants that they hired that were statisticians. And we presented them the, the nuts and bolts of the survey and how it works. And with the exception of some very few minor modifications that, that didn't change uh, the survey substantially, uh, they actually they said it was a very well designed survey and in those consultations eventually it led to certification. We were certified uh, January of 2018 and it was the first survey certified of all these new state surveys and it's the only one that's a generalized survey uh, for, for all the species, all the marine species in that state. And that also by being certified it, it leaves the door open to then receive some federal funding conducting that survey and allowing those survey data to be put into federal stock assessment. <coughs> Whichever stock you're looking at, we need to be able to use those historic landings. Um, that is still ongoing at NOAA. They've had a series of workshops throughout the Gulf with all the states involved um, and their statisticians. And they, I think they're getting closer. They actually just released, I think, a 36 page document explaining their preferred method of doing that. Um, well, so in the meantime, we're trying to reduce the spotted sea trout assessment and we need a way to look at these historical landings. We can't wait on NOAA. So we designed our own landings calibrations that simply applies a ratio between these two. Um, so let me backtrack a little bit. In 2015, we ran MRIP and LaCreel side by side in the state of Louisiana. Uh, on the effort side, NOAA ran their effort survey from 2015 through 2017 here. So there, there's some data there to be able to, to try to calibrate the two to each other, but we couldn't wait. So we just kind of used a simple ratio method and looked at the two sets of landings and applied that. Ironically enough, in this new 36 page document that just came out, NOAA's preferred method may end up being just, just a, a ratio just like this. All right, so that brings us to trout. I'm gonna go into some landings and structure. This is a tiny snippet of what ends up in the assessment, but it's nowhere near everything that goes into the assessment. So we'll start out with, uh, and we, we color coded this line so it's a little easier to see. The green is uh, 2014 forward, that's all our Lacreal landings. And this is the, the spotted sea trout landings with that 
fact calculated ratio applied to the MREP landing. So this is if you plug MREP in, converted it, but you can see we're, uh, this is 2018 right here. It's some of the, the lowest landings we've seen since we've had the recreational landing station. Of course, you had landings after the freeze of 89, and uh, this was a freeze year too. And I have a hidden slide later on if we want to, if, if we get that far, I can show you a little bit of freeze data. The, the commercial uh, landings are pretty much insignificant post entanglement net band. So these are the landings by basin. And uh, they, the num these are in millions of pounds. The, the numbers aren't as important as just to give you an idea of scale of landings in the different basins. Um, and area one is that Pontchartrain Basin, which includes everything east of the river to the Mississippi line. Barataria Basin is between the river and Bayou Lafouche and includes those, those landings in the delta. Terrebonne is what used to be the old area four or five, Lafouche to the uh, west, uh, eastern side of the Atchafalaya. And then uh, Vermilion Tesh is the Atchafalaya to Freshwater Bayou. And then Calcasieu Sabine from Freshwater Bayou all the way to the Texas lot. Uh, so you can see it's the southeast portion of the, or well, the, the eastern portion of the state mainly where, where the majority of landings happen. <clears throat> uh, this is that same sort of graphic, just uh, in bar form to give you a little, a little better idea of the lines, uh, if you prefer this sort of look at it. But you can, you can see again that the majority of the basins driving the train are uh, east of the chapel. So some landings, uh, this is percentage of total recreational harvest. If you uh, looked at what charter contributes and then what recreational contribute, rec private recreational contributes in each of those basins. You can see by far uh, <coughs> the private catch is the majority of it, uh, you know, biggest, biggest charter. And this is 2014 through 2018. And in those years, uh, you got about 6% here in, in the Barataria system uh, as far as charter comprising the total proportion of the land. Right, so this is the recreational catch per unit effort. Now this is not specific to trips that just land spotted sea trout. This is, you took the spotted sea trout catch and applied it across all the effort. Um, and you can see once again, so, you know, you're, you're topping out at three point some fish here and uh, actually in uh, Terrebo um, in 2017. But you can see once again, it's, it's the eastern and southern portion of the state there that drives the train. All right, so this is the proportion of age three fish, or H3 plus, H3 and older fish in the population. So something we've seen recently is that proportion of fish has been dropping dramatically in the population. So, you know, we used to be up here uh, between five and 10% on average. Now we're below 5%. And this is by basin. Now I'm, I'm going to show another graphic in a minute that takes out uh, the Vermilion Tesh Basin. There's so few samples in that basin. There's a lot of noise there, dependent on how many samples they may have picked up in a particular year of what size fish. But there's there's not a lot of actual age samples from that basin because there's very few samples in general because it's a lower effort. And you have the, the Atchafalaya, Atchafalaya outflow drives that basin dramatically um, as far as your ability to catch spotted sea trout and where you're going to go to catch them. So here, if, if you pull that out, this, this is the statewide line. Uh, and you can see we, we drop down and it's, it's been steadily low. Uh, 
a little bit, a little bit more older fish than Calcus used to be, but uh, still statewide when you look at it, it's down pretty low. All right, so if we, if recommendations are needed once we present the stock assessment to the commission, this is kind of kind of a timeline of, of what we would do. The assessment and the status of the stock we'd present to our commission. Uh, and we gather their input on any recommended management options that they'd like us to review and analyze that we can then bring back to them. Um, now, I will add the little nugget here that we're anticipating presenting that assessment at the September meeting. And then uh, we'll also gather public input. We'll, this will likely be public meetings given that it's spotted sea trout. We'll, we'll probably have some meetings of, along the coast to get folks input. We'll, We'll take that analysis of options, we'll bring it back to the commission uh, so they can select a path forward. And then there's that notice of intent, that, that public rulemaking process where a notice of intent would come out with proposed regulations and then that would have a public comment period, legislative oversight. Uh, yeah, six, about 60 days of public comment, 30 days for legislative oversight, and then a final rule would go, go to the commission. So with that, I'll take any questions, but I'll, let me see if I can get to this hidden slide real quick. Let me show you a little bit of, so let's see. All right, so we, um, this is nothing that's, that's uh, super vetted yet, but we decided to look at some landings and some water temperatures uh, below a certain mark in particular years and graph that against the landings. And, sorry, um, so you can kind of see we've, we've had, uh, so you can see we've had some pretty decent, uh, this over here is that winter kill index and that's the blue bar. So the higher the blue bar, the more severe as far as temperature and duration of, uh, of that cold spell uh, plotted against the landing. So you can see we've had some pretty decent, and in recent years actually, we've had a few more of these events uh, and some, some pretty decent ones. And you can see it matches up with those low level of landings in 14 and last year. I will say that this year, year to date, uh, through the end of July, our spotted sea trout landings are actually better than we were at this point last year and better than we were at this point in 2014. So that's, that's the presentation. Mm -hmm. I'll take some questions. I got one. Back, what, what's the average catch per, per angle? Per angler, it, it depends. Yeah, it rained like two to two, to, two to four, but that's applied across all the coastal effort because we didn't start taking targeted targeting information. So asking folks what particular species they targeted. Um, so we couldn't really apply this to spotted sea trout trips specifically yet because we we didn't have that proportion of anglers that listed that as a target. Now. That is different than if we did a bag limit analysis, let's say, um, which would likely be in that set information presented to the commission. And, and that'll show you of people harvesting spotted sea trout, this is how many, what percentage catches this many trout versus this many trout. But the, the reason I'm asking, because years ago, I forget if it was Harry, whoever it was, and uh, maybe there's another biologist out of the department, and said to make any difference so this came up before the speckled trout limit. Make any difference? You'd have to catch less than angler. You'd have to, in other words, if it was so, four per, per trip, you'd have to catch. Uh, uh, you have to lower the limit to two. I, I don't believe yeah, in that. Keep reason. in mind, I, I this, this is that. not that slide I showed you is not the same as a back limit analysis. Uh, those two would be on a different scale. Um, that just gives you an idea. If you took everybody that went fishing and you applied all the spotted sea trout landed. The average is about two to four fish. Right. 
That's, that's not the same as for those spotted sea trout specific trips, how many is the average angler coming back with? Um, but that would be part of a bag limit analysis and we'd show the commission, look, this is what the majority of people catch and here's a line that you can follow and look at percentage of savings to the population versus the bag limit. And that would be presented to the commission. How, how concerned are you about not seeing three pound, new three year old fish? Three year old, it's, I mean, that's a pretty significant drop in the population, in the population of older fish. So it shows we're, we're fishing a lot of younger fish. <coughs> They're not making it, whether that reason is environmental or it's harvest, we're not making it. A, a lot of fish aren't making it to three plus one. Are you speculating on why we're not? Uh, stay, stay tuned. <laughs> Someone early prediction? <laughs> Uh, the average size, average size of males at the trout. Yeah. There's a difference between male and female. From average. They, so what's the average length of a male? I mean, so, just average. Well, it, it, when you say average length, I mean, in, in relation to what? The females grow faster. Females get to 12 inches faster. Um, so there's some initial difference in growth with the females growing faster, and then it kind of, then they both kind of level out to the same. But if you're talking on, on average, like a trout is a year old, about 10 inches, and two years old, about 15 inches. But a two years old, 15 approximately. Male? Give or take. That's if you took all our age data and yeah. put a nice line through it. There's obviously, there's noise around that line, yeah, so sure. you could have an eight inch fish or you could have a 13 inch fish right. that's a year old. My, my concern, and I think I probably asked Harry about this, was, um, the impetus for this came from, the impetus for the concern about speckled trout came last year, obviously when the catches were um, in June when they dropped off pretty dramatically. Is that when, when it started? Well, it, so there's always some noise about that. Last year was a particularly bad year right. and my phone lights up more when people can't catch it. I mean, whether that's environmental, whether that's is there something with the population? It, it's just like those those previous years where we were catching them like gangbusters, nobody caught them. And said, hey, we're catching too many fish. Mm -hmm. um, it's just when you can't find them as well, yeah, my phone lights up. But you look at it, so there's some, there's something to that winter kill index. We had a severe winter, landings were down. Same as 2014, same as 1989. Uh, so there's some of that going on, but then there's a lot more that influences recruitment after that, so. The, the, the uh, reduction of the last seven to eight years in brown shrimp harvest, is, is that, I mean, does that sort of correspond <clears throat> with what you're seeing? Of, you know, all factors considered, does that make a difference? So trout are pretty opportunistic. They're gonna go where the groceries are. And if the typical groceries they don't eat aren't there, they're gonna find something else. What about habitat? I mean, is there any indication in in those surveys to show you that you know areas that may have different habitat um, loss rates or uh, may have retained some more marsh habitat uh, are, are, are more productive than other areas? So we're not. We don't have that ability yet to look at, like to, to do an ecosystem style assessment and look at landings in relation to that sort of thing. But obviously those, those marsh areas, those protected marsh areas are very important for the juvenile trout. As we lose more of that, we're gonna have issues. Um, could that be manifesting now? I, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's seems that it has manifested some in the harvest of, of other species like shrimp um, you know you, there's been some change in the sampling approach on shrimp in the barataria basin because of habitat loss it would seem that there would be a correlation there with the trout as well at some point yeah at some point as it, if habitat's gone it's going to impact your juvenile survivability 
preferred habitats for juveniles and then eventual success to adulthood. Yeah. Are we at that point? When do we get that point? I don't know. But it, when we get there, yes, it, yeah, I mean, it's going to happen. And How does that edge affect now compared to five years ago? <clears throat> Do we know how much edge you had then to now? So that's what it is. I'm sure, CP, I'm sure CPRA has that. I mean, like I said, we don't, when we're assessing the, the trout population, while we understand there's these things going on, we're not we're not at the point where we can integrate that sort of ecosystem information with, with the stock assessment. We can't say, okay, there's X amount of marsh edge left. How does that translate to population size? That, that's just sign even even you know the federal government's spending you know, millions of dollars trying to do ecosystem stock assessments and they're not even paying. Um, that's a that's a ways down the road. Uh, I think once we can do those sorts of things, that'll be. I, I think it's a it's a great tool if we can get to that point. There's just a a lot of data that needs to be collected and synthesized to do that sort of thing, and it comes down to time and money. Is there any interest on Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries as far as the drop in numbers of flounder caught in correlation to the drop in number of speckled trout? Is that even, or it's just strictly speckled uh, trout you guys are looking at? No, we, so we have the, we have some mandated stock assessments that we go through. Um, flounder, sheep's head, black drum, and mullet are mandated by the legislature to do. Uh, mullet is annually those other three are every five years. Trout and redfish are at our discretion. Okay. Um, now, I will tell you, we have seen, it's a Gulf-wide thing with the drop in flounder catches, and all the states are concerned, and we're actually, we're looking into that. We actually will have a flounder assessment come out in 2020, and we're, we're looking at some alternative methods of trying to, trying to catch flounder and develop a different method of giving, getting an index of abundance for flounder because the current gears we use aren't the best for it. Um, and when the population drops to a certain point, and, and a lot of the Gulf states use the same gear, so is it that abundance is at a point that it hasn't been in the past and now all our gears Gulf water ineffective and we've got to try something else, or is there truly something to the population? Um, so there's there's a lot of questions there still to ask and a lot of things to figure out. But yeah, it's on our radar and we're looking at it. Just real quick on flounder, I was talking to somebody from TPWD, um, they're one of their biologists, and uh, he indicated that you know, flounder, you know, water temperatures have something to do with flounder ability to spawn and reproduce. Um, not necessarily spawn and reproduce because they go offshore off the uh, shelf or somewhere near the, we don't exactly know, but they go, they go well offshore. Where temperature is important is when those larvae come back into the estuary. There's a very fine line in what makes a male versus female flounder temperature wise in the marsh. Um, and so, and Texas has done a lot of work on that in their, um, yeah. their aquaculture stuff and that's where where that came about, and it's it's one thing we're actually looking at some um, some information related to that um, as kind of a sensitivity sort of information when we do get to that um, stock assessment. Okay. Right. Anyone else? You said you yeah. guys are meeting in September. Is, are you waiting we're, on we're any in, new numbers? We're or? anticipating that the September Wildlife and Fisheries Committee will be presenting the stock assessment. <laughs> that will be on the first Thursday in September in Baton Rouge. Yeah. Right. Okay. 930. And that agenda is not set yet, so I can't say 100%, but it's the <coughs> anticipation that that's what. And if you're not on the LDWF uh, email list, uh, get on it because they will probably at least by the Monday before the meeting they will send out the agenda so that you can yeah, I think they have to do what is it 70, 72 two hours. hours ahead of time so at least by Monday morning you get it but most times you get it on Friday so um, 
Jason, thank you very much. You're welcome. Very informative. Thank you.